Okay, so right now, with us on the phone, we are talking to Professor Ross K. Baker. He is a professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Political Science, a distinguished professor, and he has a great deal of experience and history with the way that Congress works. He was a research associate at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He was also a consultant to the Democratic Caucus of the U.S. House of Representatives and a scholar in residence in the office of the Democratic leader of the U.S. Senate in 2008, 12, and 16. He also wrote a book called Friend or Foe in 1980, talking about the Senate. And he is on the board of contributors for USA Today and a commentator on National Public Radio. Professor, did I get anything wrong there? No, I, I think you summed it up very nicely. <laughs> Okay, well, let me jump right into it. Uh, the reason we're talking today is that you are a well-experienced professor of political science with decades of experience with the Senate and Congress. And recently you wrote an article that I found shocking, I agreed with, but I don't think many people are giving it the attention it deserves. The article was called, Trump's impeachment trial could render verdict on Senate and key players 2020. In some ways, the Senate is on trial as well as President Trump, says Ross Baker, a political science professor at Rutgers University. And the ability of the United States Senate to function in a reasonably systematic and sensible way in this impeachment is really a test of its institutional vitality at a time when many people, quite rightly, have called its effectiveness into question. Professor, what, did, what were you getting at in that quote? What are you trying to alert the public to, sir? Well, I sort of watched the decline of, uh, of bipartisanship in the Senate. Uh, several years ago, I wrote a book uh, uh, entitled Is Bipartisanship Dead? And I concluded at the end that it is not dead, but it certainly uh, is in the intensive care unit. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> Sorry. I think that we, we see evidence now that it may be moving down to the morgue. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Uh, and and, and I, I think that, I, I, I guess I had hoped that the Senate somehow, <clears throat> because of the design of it, founding fathers would be able to transcend better than the House of Representatives uh, the polarization which has gripped American politics. Uh, but clearly it, it, it hasn't. Um, and the, the only senators who seem to be inclined to listen to both sides of the argument on impeachment are just a handful of people. Um, and and my, I think the likelihood is that they will stick to the, uh, to the leaders of their party uh, on any final vote in the, uh, in the Senate. So, um, uh, you know, as, as the, as the uh, country has gone, as the House has gone, I think so will the Senate go uh, into the whirlpool of uh, polarization. Uh, you had also written another article, I believe, um, called Forget Trump for a Minute. It's the U.S. Senate that is on trial, political scholar right. says. And you said the Senate will either confirm its irrelevance or it will set, or set it on a new path of responsible and principled lawmaking. We will know in the next few weeks. You were talking about the impeachment trial. I think you're saying, Professor, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're going to find out if this is a truly representative body that functions in a correct democracy, watching them right now with the impeachment trial. Am I summarizing that correct? Yes, I mean, I, I think that, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the representativeness is, is, is an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think the senators, as they see it, uh, are representing their constituents, but what I don't see is uh, a sense among senators that they are willing to depart in any way from their constituents, that they have become as nervous as a Christmas goose in terms <laughs> of the next, the next vote. Um, and I think it just, just doesn't speak well of them. I, I think there are times in which you really have to show some courage. And I think that this was the kind of thing that Representative Schiff was pointing to last night. Uh, when he mentioned the courage uh, that the uh, uh, the civil servants and the foreign service officers uh, and the people from the National Security Council showed when they stepped up and testified uh, in 
front of the Intelligence Committee in the House um, and suggested, I think, in a very uh, oblique but pointed way um, that it would be nice if senators could show the same kind of courage. And, of course, uh, the courage that um, uh, that Representative Schiff wants them to show is the courage to support a... Uh, <clears throat> Support a move to uh, bring in witnesses and uh, uh, and documents uh, into the Senate trial of uh, the president. So I, I think to summarize for people who don't have a background in political science, and they're watching the impeachment trial, I I feel that your articles are saying something along the lines of, "Hey, I'm a professional scholar. I have studied the Senate for decades." They used to be an institution that was dispassionate and balanced and would say, whoa, hold on, mob, let's think about this. And now they are turning in to be representatives who are just as radical as the areas that they come from. Am I summarizing that fairly, Professor? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, that um, partisanship uh, is something novel in the Senate. There's always, of course. There's always been partisanship. And, and, you know, the, the um, degree of partisanship, the intensity of partisanship is very much, by the way, a function of the closeness of the margin of control that any party has in the Senate. Um, that the, the closer to a 50-50 Senate you get, the more intense the partisanship becomes. I think people who look upon the, the so-called golden age of the Senate we're talking about the time when there were 62 Democrats. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a majority, and, and of course, when you, when you have a fat uh, advantage like that, uh, you're inclined to, um, if you want to be, uh, magnanimous. Um, but when you're fighting over every last seat, uh, it, the, uh, the, ba- the battle becomes much more gut level. I, I recall I was looking at the uh, Is Bipartisanship Dead, a report from the Senate that you wrote in 2015. The book delivers a dispassionate analysis of the vital signs of bipartisanship in the U.S. Senate and examines the constraints on bipartisan action in an era of polarized politics. You wrote that in 2015, before anyone took Donald Trump seriously as any sort of candidate. You were saying, whoa, watch out. One of the things that grabbed me was that in that book, I haven't read the book, I'm going off the book review, so maybe this isn't completely sure. accurate, but it says that you did a shout out or a uh, cheerleading or, or, or said, hey, here's a senator named Mark Warner, and he is an example of the Senate working, you know, trying to work across the aisle. That was in 2015. In 2020, this week, Mark Warner is being called out by the media for being a partisan hack. How did he go from being an example of bipartisanship to being the epitome, according to the media, of the opposite of that within five years? Well, That's I incredible. Don't know who is, I don't know who is applying that, that uh, label to Senator Warner. I don't think he's changed. Uh, Mark Warner has, has always been somebody who uh, has, been, uh, has had very good relationships with Republican counterparts. I would point to his co-chairmanship of the, uh, vice chairmanship of the Intelligence Committee um, with, you know, with his Republican counterpart, uh, Senator Burr from North Carolina. Um, that the Intelligence Committee is one of the most bipartisan committees uh, in the Senate, and there are other bipartisan committees in the Senate, and there is bipartisan agreement in committees in the Senate. The problem comes when the committees do their work, they put they put legislation out on the floor, and the party leaders come in. Uh, they control the process, um, and they, uh, they they chart a course which is which is acutely uh, and rigidly partisan. Uh, I yeah. think if if uh, you know, and, and you know, senators get to know each other quite well in the committee. Senate committees are small. There are some committees that are more bipartisan than others. Judiciary is a committee, which is a lot of pretty hard-edged partisanship because the jurisdiction of the committee uh, contains things like, you know, abortion and school prayer and uh, just about everything, uh, you know, you can imagine that causes people to go into their corners. Uh, 
but uh, there are other committees in which uh, basically partisanship doesn't figure very prominently. Uh, in the House Agriculture Committee, for example, people don't split along party lines. They split along commodity lines. Uh, you know, it's a committee in which senators who represent rice farmers fight it out with people who run feedlots. Sure. Uh, in, term, in terms of, uh, or the Appropriations Committee, the same way. You know, you can always split the difference on money. You can't split the difference on, on principles. You can't split, split the difference on ideology. So, um, you know, I think bipartisanship still lives in secluded little corners of the United States Senate that the public doesn't see. Uh, but certainly when, you know, uh, when things get out to the floor of the Senate, when all 100 senators are, uh, are meeting and they're voting, taking the final vote on legislation, such as the 2016 tax bill, such as the uh, bill to, um, to repeal Obamacare and so on, uh, these become highly partisan events. Thank you. That's yes. So there, there certainly is functioning of government going on as it always has, and things continue. But we are seeing some polarization that we've never like levels we haven't seen before on really big issues with the public. Uh, I'd like right, to and, 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 and impeachment is the you know the super partisan issue of the day. Sure. <coughs> uh, you know, this this is the one in which um, you know there are no neutrals. <laughs> um, or if they are, they haven't certainly they haven't spoken up. What? Um, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, President Trump, you know, uh, entered the presidency uh, at a, at a period of great polarization in American politics, and he certainly has done nothing to dampen the fires of partisanship. Oh yeah, I'm a Californian, not a fan. Uh, that's right. pretty much our, our yeah absolutely I hear you I hear you, but but I, I want to gently provide. I'd like to read you two quotes, Professor, and ask you a question, if I could. Mm-hmm. Sure. The first quote comes from 2018. It's from demographer Norman Orstein. Uh, he's a well-published demographer. He looks at census reports. He's written multiple books, and he said, "2018." Well, Norman, like me, a political scientist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, well, in 2018, two years ago, two years ago, he said this. I want to repeat a statistic I use in every talk. By 2040 or so, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, meaning 30% will choose 70 senators. And the 30% will be older, whiter, rural, more male than the 70%. Unsettling, to say the least. Uh, one, one more quote, one more, if I could. This sure. is from... Paul Waldman, a reporter for the Washington Post in an article called We Are Living in the Age of Minority Rule. The name of the article is We Live in the Age of Minority Rule. He's pointing out Norman Orstein's quote and saying, In the age of minority rule, a Supreme Court justice appointed by a president who got fewer votes is confirmed by a party in the Senate that got fewer votes to validate policies opposed by most Americans. They were talking about the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, another super polarizing event. So that's two, where we're talking right. about, does the pre- president get a stay? What's the nature of the presidency and what's the nature of the Supreme Court? And two years ago, these people were saying, wow, it's super polarized. Thoughts, feelings, Professor? Is this going to get better? Because Norman Orstein is, seems to be suggesting it gets worse for the next 20 years. Is he wrong? Well, we're, we're talking about the short-sightedness of the, of the founding fathers, the people who were praised constantly in these impeachment hearings as being, uh, you know, people who were far-sighted and and uh, almost uh, like oracles in terms of their their wisdom. But one of the things that they that they agreed to was that the Senate. Uh, would would be uh, membership in the Senate would be constituted along the lines of one uh, of uh, of uh, two senators for each state. Um, perhaps you know they we, we we should condemn them for not being so uh, uh, such good soothsayers and and just in, in, in kind of looking ahead to see what the, the the composition of the American population and its distribution would be in the 21st century. Uh, and then you have to say to yourself, yes, is it is it right that the, the, the vote of one citizen of Wyoming uh, should be worth 
political terms, you know, ten times the the uh, the, the, the weight uh, of a Californian's vote. And you'd have to say yes, but then you have to follow it with, what, well, what would you do about it? Uh, which, of course, would mean um, the abolition of the Electoral College, which would require uh, a three-fifths majority of states, which would include those states that now you know, certainly you feel unjustly benefit from the fact that they have small populations and are so influential. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I have been bringing this up. You are the first academic that I have seen ever point this out. I see Senator Dianne Feinstein. I see political science professors. I see other politicians saying, oh, we got this fixed. We'll just get rid of the Electoral College and uh, get rid of the guaranteed two senators for each state. Let's go ahead and sign that legislation, and we'll get that passed. And I keep no, saying, you, how are they going to do that? Ever, if you ever want to see an example of, of, of people voting against their own self-interest, uh, that would be it. Uh, right, right. I, mean, right. I, th- I think that you would get, you'd probably be able to run up the numbers very quickly in New York and, and California and Illinois and uh, in the, some of the big population states. But when they, then you hit that wall that the, uh, that the Equal Rights Amendment hit, uh, which was that, they were, that once they got, a, got out of the states, in the states with large metropolitan areas on the coasts, uh, you run into a much more conservative, small population states that just don't see the world or the Constitution the same as uh, their colleagues and, and fellow citizens on the coasts and in the big cities. So let me ask you point blank, because I haven't seen anybody say this. Is it reasonable for someone to think, we're going to convince people in uh, Montana and Iowa to give up their electoral college vote and their guaranteed Senate seats because of democracy and it's the right things to do. We will just convince them from the moral conviction to make themselves politically irrelevant for the remainder of time. Is that a plausible theory? Because I see a lot of people saying that and I thought, you're never going to convince them to do that. Am I wrong or what's going on well, here? I, mean, I, I, I think that every Nebraska senator or every Idaho senator would immediately go to the Federalist Papers and begin quoting James Madison at length about the tyranny of the majority. <laughs> I mean, if you if you think the Federalist Papers are getting a worked out now, just wait till that particular issue comes up. So, so when we see senators like Feinstein and major network news like MSNBC saying, let's just get rid of the Electoral College, they're being a little bit fantastical. Is that fair? I, I think that's I think that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say. I mean, I think that you know, if North Dakota lost its entire population, uh, and, and its calls were being taken by South Dakota, I think they still have two senators. Right. Right. Uh, you know. Right. Right. So, if we're not going to get rid of the electoral college, as some reasonable people are suggesting, sillily, I think, and we're not going to get rid of the two guaranteed senators per state. Then does, and we have demographics experts saying these 35 states are only going to become more white, rural, hardcore, non-urban, non-diverse for the next 20 years. Do things get better, or is the Senate going to continue to destroy the progressive trajectory that America's enjoyed over the last 30 years? Well, I mean, I think you can kind of look back through history and see times in which um, <coughs> the issues were different. Um, and you know, and, you know, the, the the political map, the ideological map of the United States is not now what it was in the period after the Civil War. Um, you know, there are population shifts. Uh, there was a time when Maine was probably the most Republican state in the country. It's now, you know, some would say, you know, it's certainly more Democratic than it was, and it's it's at least a competitive state. Uh, Vermont. Uh, it was even more Republican than Maine, and now it's probably the most Democratic state. Uh, I can't remember the last Republican who was elected in Maine. Oh, they had a governor uh, that they elected, but he was extremely liberal for a Republican. But, uh, you know, it, you know population shift, the issues change. Um, and, and, and events will cause uh, people to realign politically. 
um, you know, climate change may have an effect on how people view things. Um, an economic collapse uh, might uh, shake up uh, the existing lines of American politics. Let me present a scenario, and you tell me how, if you would, <laughs> how realistic this is. You continue to have not popularly elected extremist presidents because 35 states have enough electoral colleges and you continue to have a Senate that shuts down all progressive legislation and they both continue to appoint Supreme Court justices who are conservative and lower circuit court justices who are also conservative and they basically start stop all progressive legislation from ever going further anymore and they begin to start doing as the Supreme Court did last two months overturning legal precedents that have existed for decades. Are we looking at an America where our ideas of the laws that get passed and the laws we follow could fundamentally be rewritten in a way that you can't do anything about as long as you're a citizen here and you just have to go along with? And it says things like, hey, I, I can't have an open carry permit in every state and you don't get to have uh, laws banning my amount of ammunition and women don't necessarily get access uh, to abortion. Isn't that a scary future? How possible is that? Or is this just hyperbole? Well, I mean, I would like to think that if the situation came to that, uh, that there would be a backlash of some kind, that, you know, people who have been uh, supporting uh, 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 supporting positions that they could kind of consider respectably conservative would say, whoa, you know, this is going too far. Um, you know, it may be, for example, that, you know, in, in terms of regulation, that people who have benefited from certain regulations, uh, it, occur, it occurs to them that, that uh, the deregulation is going to the point where they're no longer protected. Uh, you know, that would certainly cause, I think, a sea change in people's attitudes. Fair enough. But we have also seen a president get elected who ran on racism and xenophobia and then he's also been charged with foreign collusion and his base still loves him and hasn't changed their opinion at all in fact if i'm not mistaken the polling on impeachment has shown no significant change at all in his entire base how realistic is it that we hope that people in 35 states do the right thing and suddenly see the uh incorrect path of their ways i mean isn't that also a little fantastical? Well, I mean, it depends how transactional people want to be in November. Uh, right, you know, certainly up until now, they said, you know, this may be uh, uh, an ill-mannered and cruel man, um, uh, but by golly, he's delivered the public policies that we want. You know, he's given us the tax breaks that we want. He's given us the trade policies that we asked for. He's building the wall. He's doing all these things. Um, but at some point, people may say, but, you know, the, the character matters. They may, they may say that, yeah, it's true that, we're, we, you know, that they, these are policies that we, that we support. But, you know, we worry about our children. We worry about our country and the, and the, uh, and the image of how the world sees us. Um, and, and, you know, you're, you're, you, you know, things may, may change in terms of the way people uh, are engaged in the political system. You know, one of the things that's been so a characteristic of, of voting behavior in the United States for a long time has been the, the fact that people, uh, you know, under the age of 25 underperform. They don't show up right. at the polls. Right. And there are interests that they have that are by no means congruent with people over the age of 65, and the issues that they care about are very different. Uh, and it, it may occur to them, uh, you know, people of the age of my students, for example, that, uh, you know, our Pell grants are disappearing, uh, our work study grants are disappearing. Uh, we, have a, we, have, we have a stake in public policy that this administration is hostile to. Uh, and I think that that's obviously something that could happen in a much shorter term. So, very partisan climate, not looking good, but you're saying, hey, maybe the Senate goes too far, and those Americans in 35 states say, you know what, that's too far. 
I, I see the error of my ways and let's start making corrections and that's the hope for how this situation could get better if if those people never have that epiphany then are we looking at the horrible scenario I just described a little while back well I, I guess I I just refuse to be that pessimistic fair enough, uh, fair enough. And, I, and, I, and I do believe that that there is a kind of fundamental sense of fairness and, and decency and Americans who I think may have decided to kind of put it away in the drawer uh, for the last three years, but are, you know, I think if, if the president uh, behaves as if the president does and, 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 and really kind of crosses the line uh, so many times and with such brazenness that people say, okay, and we just can't, you know, we just can't live with this guy, uh, then I think they, they will change their voting habits. And I think the president may simply oblige his detractors by uh, uh, by his excesses uh, in pursuing the things he feels are going to get him elected. I, I hope so. I, I got to say, um, as a Latino, it was shocking to me that Trump was elected. Uh, as people say, he won. He didn't win the popular vote, but that's only because of California. If you pull California right. out of those numbers, right. a majority sure. of America in 2016 said the guy who wants to ban Muslims uh, is exceptionally disrespectful to all women, uh, called all Mexicans rapists and murderers. That's our guy. I mean, that's 51% of America outside of California said this is our guy when he said this. That's pretty bad, right? No, I mean, you know, I, I think that, you know, part of... Pro- Part of the responsibility for what happened in 2016, you know, is, is, is shared by uh, uh, by Secretary Clinton. Um, I, I don't think she was a good candidate. <laughs> uh, Fair and, enough. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think you know you can't you, you know, have to apportion the blame fairly. And, and I think that, and I, you know, she made she made a mistake. I think in her choice of vice presidential candidates, I think she could well have won electoral votes in Michigan and, and Wisconsin, certainly, and probably even in Pennsylvania, uh, if she had run with an African-American vice presidential running mate. I mean, you know, Senator Tim Kaine's a lovely guy and, and highly qualified, but I think if Cory Booker had been on the ticket, or Deval Patrick, I think very she might very well have carried those states. And I have got to go teach a Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. I'll send you a copy soon. Thanks very much. Good to talk to you. Bye-bye.